see you, but to see some of you. Um, it's going to be a short uh, lecture, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, but I'd like to start off, before we start with Rudyard Kipling, I'd like to start with something slightly different. Um, and this concerns a, a poor Scottish farmer whose name was Fleming. And one day, whilst trying to make a living for his family, he heard a cry for help coming from a nearby bog. He dropped his tools and ran to the bog and there, mired to the waist, in black muck was a terrified boy, screaming and struggling to free himself. Farmer Fleming saved the lad from what could have been a slow and terrifying death. The next day, a rather fancy carriage pulled up at the Scotsman's sparse surroundings and an elegantly dressed gentleman stepped out and introduced himself as the father of the boy that Fleming had saved. He said he wanted to repay Fleming and Fleming said that I can't accept payment for what I did and he waved away the offer. At that moment the farmer's own son came to the door of the family house and the nobleman asked is that your son? Yes the father replied proudly. He said I'll make you a deal. Let me provide him with a level of education my own son will enjoy. If the lad is anything like his father, no doubt grow to be a man we both will be proud of. And that he did. Farmer Fleming's son attended the very best schools and in time graduated from St Mary's Hospital Medical School in London and went on to become known throughout the world as the noted Sir Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin. Many years afterwards, the same nobleman's son, who was saved from the bog, was stricken with pneumonia. And what saved his life this time? Penicillin. The name of the nobleman? Lord Randolph Churchill. His son's name? Winston Spencer Churchill. Someone once said, what goes around, comes around. And I think in that certain time, it did for two very great people. About 13 or 14 years ago, my wife and I departed for the wilds of North Devon for Christmas. Well, we were staying in a hotel two miles outside of a town called Westwood Ho, or village. And we got there on the 24th of December. And by the 27th, she had just about all of me that she could possibly take. And I was treated to the words, will you please go away and play golf? I decided to go and I managed to book in for a game at Westwood Ho Golf Club, Royal North Devon Golf Club. And upon turning up, I was met by some beautiful people there who said, well, we're so sorry, but we forgot to tell you that there's a society match today. Would you mind going on the back end of it as a visitor? No. I don't mind. In fact, I played so well that I, I actually won a very, very nice Pringle sweater. I suppose, as it was the visitor's prize, I had a good chance of winning it if I was the only visitor there. But nonetheless, it remained with me a long time. They fed me and gave me brandy, which at eight o'clock in the morning is always worthwhile, and suggested that for a while I could have a look round there very, very well set up museum and I was looking at the mashing niblicks, the leather balls, the feather balls, the whole thing and on the way out I saw on the wall a, just a click frame. Uh, nothing, you know, one of these things, 99 pence from one of your local stores and then it was a typed letter signed obviously and the letter was addressed to J.H. Taylor Esquire who was the grandfather of British golf, if you don't know. The Royal North Devon Golf Club, Westwood Ho, Devon. It was dated 1928 and it read, My dear Mr Taylor, I am in receipt of your letter dated the 14th inst and I very much regret that I should be unable to be present upon the 75th anniversary celebrations 
of the club. My wife, as you know, has been unwell for some time and she is presently taking the waters at Bath. I recall with great affection the times I spent on the burrows and indeed remember only too well being the first out in the morning and cutting our own holes on the greens. May I wish you all a very happy time and every continued success. I do hope you don't mind, but I have forwarded your letter to my nephew who collects the autographs of famous people. Yours very truly. A nice, polite letter to one of the great characters of British golf, which I came across honestly in exactly the way I've just described. And then, in its unremarkable, but until I saw the signature at the bottom, and that was that of Joseph Rudyard Kipling. Such was the nature. Cough. That was the nature. Such was the nature of the man that he never really considered himself as being only as one who'd been fortunate enough to have proved popular for the section of the public. I wonder if he ever envisaged that his own popularity and that of his many works would subsist 84 years after his death. His was a life full of complexities, a life full of joys and sorrows, and it's my intention to give a very brief overview of his 70 years. Rudyard Kipling was born in Bombay, India on the 30th of December 1865. The first child of John Lockwood Kipling and Alice Kipling. His father was a professor of architectural sculpture at Bombay School of Art and was himself an author having written The Beast and Man in India and will be perhaps best remembered for his illustrations to Kim in 1901. Sorry, if I can... Um, brethren, for those of you who have not muted your uh, speakers, could you please do so? Because we can hear a lot of bad chat in the background. Uh, once again, if you could all please put yourselves on mute. Thanks, Chris. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Right now, wild animals are caught in a nightmare of abuse, trapped for years in tiny cages. Put through the most I'm not quite sure where we've got another channel on, maybe somewhere. Uh, Mahir, can Never you mind. to see who's not on mute, please? Don't their cries for help. Listen and give three pounds a month. <laughs> Not me. Who's that? Chetan Patel is not on mute, I don't think. I'm on mute. Keith Smith is also on. You should mute. Well, I'm muting everyone, then I'm mute, Chris, yourself. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right, go ahead. Yeah. No worries. Um, John King was uh, sorry, a famous author and will perhaps be best remembered for his illustrations to Kim in 1901. Rudyard Arthur, Alice, the sister of Lady Byrne Jones, of the Sir Edward Byrne Jones, the distinguished pre Raphaelite painter. Her other sister, being the mother of Stanley Baldwin, the future Prime Minister of the UK, or of England. At five years old, Rudyard and his sister, named Alice after their mother, were sent to England to receive their formal education. They were fostered with a rigidly Calvinistic family for six years, where the young Kipling was treated with considerable cruelty. Elements of this protracted childhood ordeal appear in The Light That Failed, and more directly in the story Barbar Black Sheep from Wee Willy Winkie and other stories. Perhaps as a consequence of these unpleasant memories of his formative years in England, the memories of India became a place of Edenic unity, far beyond all divisions of race, caste and religion, and so different from that dark land which was England. The ambiguous position between his lost Eden and the larger colonial structure 
was to become the subject of many of his poems. 1878 saw Rudyard Kipling enrolled in the United Services School in Westwood Ho, Denver, a school founded by Indian Army officers to provide affordable education for their sons. It was usually the case that most of its pupil would late, pupils would later join the army. And even if the majority of those who didn't still return to India to seek a fortune. Even in these formative years, the young Kipling became editor of the school magazine Chronicle. At the age of 17, Kipling returned to India to take up a position on a newspaper which his father had procured for him. This paper, Civil and Military Gazette, published in Lahore, catered for the British establishment in the Punjab. As a consequence of this journalistic apprenticeship, he would see for himself the processes of the British Empire at work in every conceivable manner, good and bad. He encountered everyone from the Viceroy to the lowliest of civil servants and was especially drawn to the enlisted men of the British Army an interest that would soon become an integral and prominent part of his writings. On the 5th of April 1886, at the age of 20 years and four months, he was initiated into Hope and Perseverance Lodge, number 782 in Lahore, by special dispensation. He was passed on the 3rd of May 1886 and raised on the 6th of December of 1886. As if that wasn't enough, he was appointed acting secretary of the lodge on that day, pardon me, and had the unusual, somewhat unusual privilege of recording his own raising into the minutes. He records that he was initiated by a Hindu, passed by a Mohammedan, raised by an Englishman, that the lodge had a tiler who was an Indian Jew, contained both Sikh and Brahmin members. The locals referred to the lodge as the house of magic, for where else could such a diversity of religions and castes come together in perfect harmony? He was elected as secretary on the 10th of January 1887 and remained in office until the summer of that year, when he removed to Allahabad. On the 4th of April 87, he delivered his first lecture to the lodge entitled The Origin of the Craft First Degree. July the 4th of that year saw him deliver his next lecture, Popular Views on Freemasonry. A great friend of his was Robert Baden Powell, who incorporated many of Kipling's ideas into the founding of the Boy Scout movement in the early 20th century. A letter dated the 4th of August 1889 tendered his resignation from the lodge when it became obvious to him that he would not be returning to India to live. His other Masonic affiliations were in chronological order as follows. 14th of April, 1887, advanced into Fidelity Mark Lodge number 98 in Lahore, and on the same day was elevated into the Mount Ararat Lodge of Royal Art Mariners number 98. He resigned from both of these on the 30th of April, 1889. 17th of April, 1888, he joined a Lodge of Independence with Philanthropy, number 391, in Allahabad. He resigned 31st of December, a year later, in 1889. 4th of October 1889, he was elected the honorary member of Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, number two, Scottish Constitution. 1905 to 1908, he was elected as Poet Laureate of that lodge, following the footsteps of another illustrious brother, one Robbie Burns. 8th of July 1908, he was admitted as a member of the Societas Rosacruciana. May 1918, he elected as an honorary member of the Correspondent Circle of the Quator Coronati Lodge, number 2076 in London. Also in 1918, he was made an honorary member of the Motherland Lodge, number 3861, and also of the prestigious Authors Lodge, Number 3346. In 1922, as a member of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, he was a founder member of the builders of the Silent City Lodge, number 12, which was under the Grand Lodge Nationale Francais. 
when the Commission's headquarters were situated at Omer, Saint Omer, in the part of Calais North. The Commission shipped premises to London in 1925, and the senior members of the lodge, Kipling included, founded the Builders of the Silent City Lodge number 4943. The only time he held office, other than that Secretary of 782, was on his last visit to 782 in May 1888, when he acted as inner guard. Rudyard Kipling left India when he was only 23 years old, and, except for a brief return in 1891, he would never again visit those shores. In 1892, Joseph Rudyard Kipling married Caroline Starr Ballestier, emigrated to the United States, and through her, made the acquaintance of many of the notable American authors of that time. 1889 saw the first of the great tragedies which would beset the Kipkins throughout their lives. This was the death of their firstborn child, Josephine, in New York. During their stay in America, Caroline had a severe dispute with her brother, which resulted in a very messy and protracted lawsuit that attracted a vast amount of media interest. Horrified by the attention, the family Kipling returned to England, thus continuing the restlessness which had been such an integral part of his makeup since childhood. With the start of the Boer War in South Africa, Kipling once again found a cause linked to the imperialistic ideal, which he was able to devote his energies to. This is reflected in many of his reportings and writings of the period. From 1900 to 1908, he lived outside of Cape Town and produced a vast amount of work, most of which was of a political nature, which became his prominent theme and, and which in itself alienated him from the British public until the commencement of hostilities in 1914. He had the distinction of being awarded an honorary degree from Oxford University in 1907 with one of his contemporaries, Mark Twain. In the same year, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature, the first British writer to be so honored. World War I proved a brazen diversion for the embittered who had long predicted Germany's rivalry with Britain would result in conflict and who reveled in patriotic occasions. In 1915, he arranged for his son, John, to join his old friend, Lord Roberts, newly formed 2nd Battalion Irish Guards as a second lieutenant. This was after John's rejection due to his poor eyesight by Kitchener's volunteers. John at this time was only 17 years old and had to have his father's permission to serve overseas. This Kipling readily gave. Just four months later at the Battle of Luz, John was reported wounded and missing in action. Desperately hoping their son had survived, Rudyard and Carrie made countless journeys to France, visiting hospitals and talking to the soldiers who may have served with their son. All their efforts were to prove in vain and eventually they had to accept that their son was indeed dead. About I think about 10 years ago, um, another skeleton was found on the battlefield, which had some dog tags on it. Um, DNA was extracted and it, it proved the uh, um, paternal line to Rudyard Kipling. So his son was eventually buried properly. This tragic loss leads to Kipling changing from the poet of the empire to the poet of bitterness and guilt. A line penned by Kipling sums up his continual feelings of guilt. If any question why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. Back in his study, he undertook the mammoth unpaid task of compiling the history of the Irish guards in the Great War. A meticulous recording of every soldier's death he was appointed to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, 
and it's his words that are found on the thousands of unidentified graves. A soldier of the Great War, known unto God. During these latter years, Rudyard and Carrie lived at Bateman's in Burwash, after moving from their beloved Rottingdean. And it was during this period he was honoured with the Royal Society of Literature's Gold Medal in 1926, which had previously only been conferred upon Sir Walter Scott, George Meredith and Thomas Hardy. Illustrious company indeed. He was appointed as the Lord of the University of St Andrews and received doctorates from the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, McGill in Montreal and Paris. His health had declined over the years and he constantly suffered with stomach problems which were never fully diagnosed. But there was a lighter side to the Kipling family life, as at one time living at Burwash, <coughs> oh, no. a local contractor left his van parked outside Kipling's house for some, some several days. Kipling wrote to the contractor to remonstrate. Uh, there was no reply or no response. So he wrote again, and this time more forcibly. Still the van remained. Meeting the contractor in the street, he asked, why? Well, said the contractor, I sold your first letter for five quid. For the second, which was stronger, I've got ten, and I was hoping, Governor, there'd be another. Entrepreneur. Carrie was the managing force of the household, and on one occasion, Rudyard went to the local bank to change a cheque, but was at first refused as no one in the bank recognised him, having only dealt with his wife. Even as a celebrated author, he preferred the anonymity of his family existence. The end of 1935 saw great national celebrations for the 70th birthday of Britain's favourite author, but his death just a few weeks later on January the 18th, 1936, was overshadowed by the grave illness of his good friend, King George V, who died two days later. Kipling was buried in Westminster Abbey, alongside T.S. Eliot, and his poor bearers included a Prime Minister, an Admiral, and the head of a Cambridge College. Although he never proceeded through chair, he certainly rose to eminence by merit, lived respected, and died regretted. Now I'd like to just give you a few little samples of um, some of the poetry of Kipling, which has certainly Masonic in its influence. This first one is from um, The Palace from 1903. When I was a king and a mason, a master proven and skilled, I cleared me ground for a palace such as a king should build. I decreed and dug down to my levels and presently under the silk, I came on the wreck of a palace such as a king had built. There was no worth in the fashion. There was no wit in the plan. Hither and thither, aimless the ruined footings rang. Masonry brute mishandled, but carven on every stone. After me cometh a builder. Tell him I too have known. In a similar strain is the nostalgic, which I'm sure you, you most everybody knows, the Mother Lodge from the Seven Seas in 1896. Nothing better expresses the multiracial construction of the craft, something which appealed in no small measure to Kipling. There was Rundle, station master, and Beasley at the rail. An Ackman, commissariat and donk into the jail. And Blake, conduct a sergeant, our master twice was he, with him that kept the Europe shop, old friend G. Edward G. The outside sergeant, sir, salutes, alarm, inside brother, and it doesn't do no harm. We met upon the level and we parted on the square. And I was junior deacon in me mother lodge out there. We'd bowl a naff accountant and saw the Aiden Jew. And Din Muhammad, draftsman, the servant. There was Babu Chaka Butty, and Amir Singh, the Sikh. Oh, and Castro from the fitting sheds, the Roman Catholic. We are the, we the same. 
we hadn't good regalia. We hadn't good regalia and our lodge was old and bare, but we knew the ancient landmarks and we kept them to an air. Full oft on government service, this roving foot of pressed and bore fraternal greetings to the lodges, east and west, according as commanded from Kohat to Singapore. But I wish that I might see him in my mother lodge once more. In 1938, according to Lieutenant General Sir George McMunn, the Europe shop was still kept by a friend G.L.G.'s son in the Lahore cantonment called Yamir. This then is a brief snapshot of the life and times of Joseph Rudyard Kipling, man and mason. Before we go, or before I go, um, I'm going to read you a poem which some of you may or may not have heard of. If you have knowledge, if you haven't, you may want to look this one up. It's called Banquet Night. Once in so often, King Solomon said, watching his quarrymen draw the stone, we will club our garlic and wine and bread and banquet together beneath my throne. And all the brethren shall come to that mess as fellow craftsmen, no more and no less. Send a swift shout to Hiram of Tyre, felling and floating our beautiful trees. Say that the brethren and I desire talk with our brethren who use the seas. And we shall be happy to meet them at mess as fellow craftsmen, no more and no less. Carry this message to Hiram of Biff, excellent master of forge and mine. I and the brethren would like it if he and the brethren would come to dine. Garments from Bosra or morning dress. As fellow craftsmen, no more and no less. God gave the hyssop and cedar their place. Also the bramble, the fig and the thorn. But that is no reason to black a man's face because he is not or he hasn't been born. And as touching the temple, I hold and profess. We are fellow craftsmen, no more and no less. So it was ordered and so it was done. And the hewers of wood and the masons of mark with folks or hands of the side and run, and navy lords from the royal ark, came and sat down were merry at mess as fellow craftsmen, no more and no less. The quarries are hotter than Hiram's forge. No one is safe from the dog whip's reach. It's mostly snowing up Lebanon Gorge, and it's always blowing off Joppa Beach. But once in so often the messenger brings Solomon's mandate, forget these things. Brother to beggars, and fellow to kings, companion of princes, forget these things. Fellow craftsmen, forget these things. And I think that just about sums up the Mark degree pretty well. That's all from me. And if you've got any questions, you can, you're quite happy to ask them because I'm turning mute now, so you won't get any answer. Chris, first and foremost, thank you very much. I think a round of applause from everybody for that. Absolutely wonderful. Great Brilliant, Chris. Absolutely magnificent. Um, brethren, um, no, I'm conscious nothing. that there are quite a few of us on this group. So if you would like to ask a question, if you could please wave, make, make or let us know, and uh, we'll get you on. Or just simply unmute yourselves and ask away. Well, well done from our own Baloo. Chris, you're on mute. I know that voice. But I, I have a question. Uh, that sounds, sounds very much like Vincent Fatoroso. All right. Can, can I ask my question? No. Chris, you... <laughs> you, you mentioned Lodge Canagate co-winning number two and, and the fact that Kipling was made a member there. Um, is that because he'd been a regular yeah. attender or I, I, I'm not aware that he was an, in Scotland all that often. I've never heard that before. No, he, he was made it purely because of, uh, of who he was and what he had done and how he... He tried to promote masonry in Scotland and England and all over the place without actually being involved in it too much himself. But I, and I can't remember the names, Tom, but there were a few of the guys who found him Lodge of the Silent City who were Scottish Masons who come down particularly for it. So I think he was, he was awarded that on, on that basis. Chris, and... Uh, the... I, I've been to... Sorry. Sorry, carry on. 
No, go on. I was going to say, the lodges in India, are they still running? Are they still... Not all of them, no. Um, I can tell you which ones are, because I've, I've marked them. Uh, as far as I'm aware, Hope and Perseverance is at 762. Um, the other ones that are mentioned there, no. Uh, Fidelity Mark, I'm not sure about that. Um, to be honest, I should have looked that up and I haven't. I know we've got a few brethren on here. That is a... Perhaps they can look it up for us. Yeah. No, as far as I know, the most of these lodges are in Pakistan, not in India, no. Because he joined in Kabul and he joined in uh, Lahore. So he's not, uh, mostly he's not uh, in India. I think at the time he joined, it would have been India as a whole, though, right? I think that's perhaps why it comes yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, that was a joint in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that the lodge would actually move from, if I said, from district to district. Um, no, well, I should say, I don't think the lodge would stay in the district if it proved um, inhospitable. So I, I'm not sure. To be honest with that, but as far as I'm aware, uh, M62 is still still going, but that could could have, could be gone by now. Thanks, Chris. Chris. Yeah. Um, have you visited Batemans? Do you know I haven't, and that's a, something I should be kicking myself for for quite a few months yet. Um, it was on my list to do, and then we decided to move up here. All so right, it, shame. Be, uh, you, must, you must get there if you can. Fabulous. It's fascinating. And yeah. um, <coughs> many years ago, since I was last there, but one of the things I remember was um, it was one of the first houses in the south of England to have a permanent electricity supply because yeah. I'm not sure where he got it from, but he had a a water turbine which supplied electricity to the house and the turbine was still there when I visited quite a few years ago. So, uh, fascinating place, very beautiful too. Yeah, I don't know how it, how it sets in, in the village itself, where, whether it's, I think it's, I think from what I was told it was on the outskirts, but it's definitely somewhere I want to go. I mean, the, I, there was a film which I'm not, a, a great lover of films, but there was a film about Kipling and his son called My Son Jack about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And it had um, the guy who played Harry Potter, Daniel, whatever. He played the son. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember the guy who played Kipling. But you know something? He was the, uh, blinking identical. And the, the, way it, the way it happened, it was, yeah. It, it was it was it gotcha. If you read the history of what happened there, you 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 twig it straight away. But he looked he looked like Kipling. He sounded like Kipling, and even the lady that played um, Caroline, she had a just a slightly American accent. Because so, yeah, you're not too far from there, uh, really, Cliff, are you? Oh, no, it's a bit further away. At the time, I was living in Kent, and uh, it was fairly close then. One of the other things I uh, particularly enjoyed was um, Kipling's film, The Man Who Would Be King. I think oh, it yeah. starred Michael Caine, did it? Yeah. Michael Caine <laughs> and Roger Moore. Uh, Sean Connery. And it was yeah. where... Sean Connery. Uh, Sean, Sean Connery, yeah. Sean Sorry, Connery. yeah, not Roger, not Roger Moore, Sean Connery, yeah. It was actually where uh, Michael Caine met Shakira, because she, Shakira was starring in that film as well. She played the love interest. With regard and, to um, the, oops, sorry. Go on. That's what I was going to say. With regard to my boy Jack, uh, David David Haig played Rudyard Kipling and Daniel Radcliffe as John. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fabulous, fabulous actor. Uh, hello. 
Yes, Can I come in? Keith Smith. Hello. There is a, hello, Keith Smith. There is a television okay. program on the house with the um, power of the water and that. And I'm trying to think of it, but if you look it up, they actually take you for a tour, a vertical tour, virtual tour. One of the, um, they took you around these special houses. I think it was, um, Phil from uh, Phil and what's her name would do the uh, ha has it, you know, um, love it, hate it, or move it. Kirsty, oh, right. Kirsty. Um, done a tour of the um, house. Somebody did because they showed you the water turbine and the electricity and everything that was connected up. Very interesting program. I think it was about five years oh. ago they done it, but. Yeah, I think for the times that they were then, I mean, this was really state of the art, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, it was, it was brilliant because they had connecting telephones and everything, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, and if any brother wishes to go on there, it's uh, easily available. If you just Google it, um, Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's Home Tour, there's quite a few YouTubers on there who have done the tour, and uh, there's also an official site as well we can go to. Can we can we just establish if Cliff has stopped wading in the Ganges now? <laughs> yes, um, although I might be back there because it's been raining quite hard today. <laughs> it's still got quite a lot of flooding <laughs> down here. Really? And, and the man who would be king wouldn't, of course, be feasible without a Scotsman in it. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Are you creeping again, Fat Rosa? <laughs> Simon, uh, Simon Dodd, got a question? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, from the sounds of it, in the craft, it sounds like Kipling didn't actually go through the chair. Was that the case in the mark as well? Yeah, he never progressed through any chairs. What a crying shame. Mm. It was. I think you have to look at his, his life and times. I mean, when in the First World War, he was actually a war correspondent. Um, yep. For, and he actually reported on the, uh, the Battle of Jutland. And of course, he was writing up the report of the sinking of a load of British ships. And um, also, he had to write all that up. So he saw the loss of thousands of lives, so pretty well up close and personal. And I think that affected him. Um, I think to the point where he just didn't want to do anything anymore. He just wanted to sit back in Burwash and, and write his poetry, uh, which he did. But as I say, it wasn't, it was a bit dark. Poetry he wrote there. So he was a regular attender then in the craft in the mark then, as far as we know. Well, yeah, nobody's, nobody's sort of said it to disprove that. But we, yeah, I think as far as it goes, he was. Um, I was a bit too young to go there then, but um, as far as I can understand, yes. I mean, he attended when he could. I think that's the, the thing. To look at. I mean, the, the lodges he were in, was in, uh, the builders of the silent city over here, that met at um, Freemasons Hall or equivalent. But he was living in Burwash, and that's a fair old journey. Well, he'd come in on <coughs> a train, I suppose, but it was a fair old journey in and back. But, um, I don't know, wherever he went, <coughs> he would have been enjoyed, that's for sure. Thank you, Chris. No worries, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Brethren, anybody else? Uh, would you like to add any questions? Um, yes, of course. Who's that? I want to say Mark Howell here. I just want to say something more of a, a statement more than a question. Of course, Kipling only had one child that went into adolescence, and that was uh, uh, Elsa or Elsie. And um, she went to live in Wimpole Hall in Cambridgeshire. And she looked after her father's estate. Uh, when he died, and she bequeathed it then to the University of uh, Sussex in Brighton. So his actual line stopped there. 
But um, yeah, so if you go to Wimpole Hall, although he didn't live there, he just stayed there occasionally, that was um, Rudyard Kipling's daughter's home. Excellent, thanks Mark. Um, brethren, before anyone else um, has any questions, if I could just remind you all that we've got uh, James Innes next um, Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. doing a lecture on surviving depression. James is a Mason. He's been a Mason for over 20 years. Um, he gave a, a rotary talk on Zoom recently, which I heard went down really, really well. He also wrote an article in the last um, Freemasonry uh, or Freemason Today magazine, which was also really well received. So I think um, it's been wonderful today. Thank you very much again, Chris, and everyone else for joining in. A special thank you to all those brethren who have um, dialed in from abroad. Um, we know the time scales and the time differences can you know, be a bit of a challenge, but thank you very much for coming on board. But if you could all put it in your diaries for next Tuesday, as I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful um, talk. Um, what James wants to do is a 15 minute talk and then a 40 minute to give or take a Q and A session. Um, I think we'll all be able to get some valuable information um, and be able to obviously ask him. Um, uh, depression is one of those things that a lot of people go through. Um, a lot of the times it's under the radar and sadly we don't find out till sometimes it's too late. Um, so I'm sure we can all take, um, take some good learning from that for next week. Um, but uh, back over to you guys. If you've got any questions, please do ask away. I have a... Can you email the details for that? Sorry. Yes, I will. So the details will be on the Freemasons Without Borders Facebook page. Um, if you haven't already joined it, uh, please let me know. As all the Zoom calls that we do, the recordings will be put onto that page as well. Um, Vincent, if you can't find it, let me know and I'll, I'll get it over to you. It, it's the same, it's the same link as, as this one. Same link and password. Won't it be? I hope so. My yes, it is. It is, Tom. Yes, that's correct. Oh, and go. I've just shared through the chat box with, with everyone the... Uh, next meeting's link it is the same, literally the same li uh, link like uh, Tom said. We also got uh, 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 Worshipful Brother, Rob Worshipful Brother Ryan Williams uh, will be giving a lecture about progressive side orders on 12th of May. Uh, we are expecting a lot of brethren around the world. Uh, we, let, we emailed all the provinces and they are all sharing uh, this uh, meeting information. Hopefully we will Upgrade the account. Of we we expecting a lot of uh, brethren uh, to join this meeting. So uh, please do follow uh, the Facebook page uh, Freemasons Without Borders, which we just shared through the chat box. And once again, uh, Chris, thank you very much for uh, for this lovely presentation, and thank you everyone for attending. Unless anyone else has a question, we will be publishing this video in about. 20 minutes on the web, uh, Facebook pages. Mahe, Keith if I Smith may. from Essex. Uh, so, Robert. Hey. Keith Smith from Essex. Can I just ask, this is my first Zoom uh, meeting with any type of meeting. Am I coming over clear? Am I being seen? Or is everything okay from my end? Very hey, high, brother. Yes and yes. You are very clear. Uh, you're clear, uh, your room is tidy. Okay, that, that's all I, I wasn't certain whether I was working for it, but was working for it, but the first Zoom I've done, but uh, thank you very much for letting me join you. Very interesting. Look forward to next Tuesday. If I can make it, I will be here. Brilliant. Um, and again, thank you to the brethren from South Africa, Bermuda, Spain, India, Athens, Blackpool, <laughs> Wales, and Nigeria. For <laughs> uh, it's wonderful to have you guys all on board. Um, if you have, if anyone does want to do a lecture or has a specific topic they would like to speak about, um, doesn't have to be Mark Masonry, it can be craft, it can be a side order, um, something that doesn't involve obviously any sort of ritual um, itself, because there may be a few on here that aren't part of the orders, please feel free to email myself or Mahir and let us know um, if you'd like to, um, A, if you know somebody or if you'd like to elect yourself and we can add you onto the list. But once progressive again, orders, Amit. Progressive well. orders and side orders. Correct. Progressive orders and side orders. Mm. 
Wonderful, brethren. Well, I wish you all a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. And so thank you. Thank you. Stay See safe. you next week. Everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. No worries, Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Have a nice day. Hello, my here. Hello. Take care, guys. Hello, my here. Can you hear me? Who is this? Sorry. My here. Spot Vincent? Yes. Okay, this is Dr. Kalala. Okay, this is Dr. Kalala. You sound, uh, your sound is echoing, so yes, uh, you, could you please turn your uh, turn off your speaker a bit? Yes, I'm calling from the Gambia. I would like to know how to subscribe to the famous uh, without bor uh, borrows. Uh, we just shared the link through the uh, chat group. If you check the link, I just shared. You just click on it and follow the page. Yeah, because I was following uh, this discussion, it was, it was quite uh, interesting. And uh, I believe that uh, you are being followed uh, in the world by all the Masons. And it is quite interesting. And I would like to follow all of the lectures and uh, to know how the things are working. And uh, That's great. I've just, shared, I've just time. shared the link with you. Uh, if you check your uh, chat box, there is a link for you to just click on and follow the page. Right? Okay. Thank you. And see you next week, uh, Vincent.